Welcome everyone to FuseNet's West Africa Post Outlook Briefing for the period October 2023 through May 2024. My name is Lita Branham and I'm a Senior Food Security Analyst with FuseNet and I'm joined presenting today by Marius Ratulajanahari and Anu Atre, both Food Security Analysts with FuseNet. So today we will go over the key messages for the briefing as well as provide a brief regional overview and then dive into two key areas of concern for the region, which uh, this for this period will be Nigeria and Burkina Faso. So with that, I will turn it over to Marius for the key messages. Uh, thank you, Lita. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, let's get started with the key messages. Uh, conflict remains the key driver of acute food insecurity in the region. Conflict has displaced millions of people away from their typical source of food and income, and this and is disrupting livelihood activities, market functioning, trade flows, and seasonal transhumanist movement. Regional production for the 2023-2024 season is near average. However, localized deficits were observed in Nigeria, Niger, Mali. Burkina Faso, Mauritania, and Chad due to insecurity limiting access to farmland, dry spells throughout the season, and poor macroeconomic conditions in Nigeria limiting access to agricultural inputs. During the post-harvest period, several prices are seasonally declining across most of the region. However, prices remain significantly above the five-year average due to localized below-average production, high inflation in Nigeria, sustained institutional demand, and disrupted trade flows and insecurity. Level of acute food insecurity are at their seasonal low and will begin to increase through early 2024. Crisis IPC phase three outcomes are likely to persist in conflict affected areas in northern and eastern Burkina Faso, parts of northern Nigeria and northern Mali, Tilaberi and Tawa region in Niger, northern and eastern Chad, the northwest and southwest regions of Cameroon, and the Central African Republic. Emergency IPC phase four outcomes are likely in northern Burkina Faso and parts of northeast Nigeria. There is a risk of famine IPC phase five in Jibo of some province in Burkina Faso. In BCG, Jibo, a large scale attack on the military and civilian and suspension of aid due to insecurity warrants increasing alarm for current civil current severe to extreme level of acute food insecurity. While emergency IPC phase four is assessed to be ongoing, I mean IPC phase five would likely occur in conflict restrict already low level of cultivation, humanitarian aid and market supplies more than currently anticipated. Concern for this outcome will intensify the longer humanitarian access and aid is suspended. So um, for the regional overview, so let's begin with the seasonal calendar for West Africa. The production period runs from October 2023 to June 2024. In the Sahel, the ongoing main harvest will continue until January, followed by an off-season harvest until April 24. The pastoral lean season will begin in April. In the south bimodal zone, including southern Nigeria and southern Cameroon, the second rainy season will start in October, is underway until the middle of January. And the, season, and the second rainy season will begin in March. The period is also marked by the harvest of different agricultural products until the end of April 2024. Next slide, please. In the region, Arsenian conflict is uh, particularly um, located in um, Liptako-Gurma region. 
Conflict and insecurity remain the key driver of acute food insecurity across most of the region. Conflict impact household livelihood, disrupt market functioning, disrupt cross-border trade, and, and lead to the displacement of population. The three main hotspots of conflict in the region are the Liptako Gurma region, the Lake Chad Basin, and the northeast of Nigeria. While conflict has remained more or less stable in the Lake Chad Basin and the northeast Nigeria, the Liptako Gurma region for border areas between Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso remain one of the key conflict hotspots globally. The map on the left shows the density of conflict events in the Liptako Gurma region. The conflict events are higher in bordering areas of Niger and Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso, across northern Burkina Faso, and the bordering areas of Burkina Faso and Mali. These conflict events constitute attacks by armed groups against civilians and the position of secu security forces. Data will touch on Burkina Faso on in greater depth when later in the briefing. In Mali, the United Mission has finished its, its withdrawal from the country amid renewed hostility between the government and the coordination of Azawad Movement, or CMA, in northern Mali. A notable increase in security incident in Kidal and Menaka have been observed since late uh, August. In Niger, conflict events increased in July and August following the coup, but they decreased in September and October 2023. These armed groups' attack on civilians led to the displacement of people. The map on the right shows the displacement of people in the region. Over 3 million people have been displaced, who official estimate from Burkina Faso and the Mali date back to March, April, while population displacement have continued. 70% of these displaced people are in Burkina Faso. Next slide, please. The Sudanese refugee continued to arrive in, in Chad. In Chad, along the Lip the Lake Lek province, eastern Chad remains an area of particular concern. The ongoing conflict in Sudan still drives the influx of Sudanese refugees and Chadian returnees in the eastern province of Chad. On November 25th, 421, over 421 refugees and over 98,000 um, returnees arrived in Chad, over 491,000 refugees of whom 77% are in Udai province. In the context of declining agricultural production, these refugees put pressure on livelihood and compete with the host communities for the minimal agricultural and non-agricultural labor opportunities. Food assistance needs are increasing rapidly, but funding challenges limit the response of humanitarian organization. Next slide, please. Production and agroclimatology. The main season harvest is underway across the region. The season was marked by a deficit in rainfall and dry spell in several areas, particularly in southern Chad, the northeast of Nigeria, and the Liptako Kurma region. Of the map on the left show uh, in the highlight those regions um, and show the vegetation condition across the region in mid-October where green represent average to above average vegetation conditions and brown represent below average conditions. Despite the erratic rainfall observed this year, vegetation conditions were generally near average. Regional production was near average, though we've localized deficit across most countries. The map on the right shows cropping conditions across the region as of late November. As we can see, conflict remains the main barrier to agricultural production, as insecurity limits household access to fields, disrupts the distribution of seed and inputs. The pastoral situation differs from one country to another, except in localized areas, 
Overall, water and pasture availability are average in Nigeria, Cameroon, and Mali. The deficit of rainfall in pastoral areas of Niger, Chad, Central North, and the Sahel region of Burkina Faso has reduced forage avail availability and led to early changes. Excellent piece. The cross-border uh, trade um, uh, flows. Uh, regional trade flows are impaired by significant high transportation costs and persistent conflict in different conflict hotspots, as well as harassment at the border control or other control points, export bans and border closures, and other restrictions, including export authorizations or export taxes. From up on the left show market and trade functioning, in the Liptako Gourmet region in September 2023, where the green shows normal activity and the yellow, um, some disruption, and the light brown to dark brown limited no activity. Market supplies are very low in blockaded areas, um, such as in Gao, Menaka, and Tombuktu in Mali and northern Burkina Faso. Uh, so those uh, regions are in the map highlighted in a uh, square. In Burkina Faso, supplies to market rely on armed escorts, resulting in supply delays up to five months. In Niger, border closure between Niger, Benin, and Nigeria due to economic sanctions imposed by ECOWAS continue to impact cross-border flows, where alternative and unmonitored routes are used by traders. Additionally, the recent alliance between Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger agreed to continue exporting to Niger. In the map, in the photo on the, the right, it shows the frontier ferme, which is um, the border is closed. Next slide, please. High staple food prices are across the regions. Macroeconomic conditions in the region are largely influenced by economic crisis in Nigeria, which is due to the compounding impact of limited national revenue, spiking inflation, a devalued currency, and a shrinking national reserve. The graph on the left shows the inflation rate in the region as of September 2023. In Nigeria, the inflation rate is in double digits at 26%, while in Niger, Chad, Cameroon, and Mauritania, high inflation rate persists even if it is less than 10%. Inflation coupled with high global staple food price, prices, conflict, in disrupt, uh, conflict and disrupted trade flows are maintaining above average staple food prices across the region. Despite the seasonal decline, in prices with ongoing harvest. The map on the left shows the price of millet compared to five-year average. Millet prices vary from 10 to 49% above the five-year average across the region and the 50% in Nigeria. So, next slide, please. So those are um, areas in the square. So let's look at the regional food uh, security outcome. In relatively secured areas, poor households have access to food from their own harvest, income and in kind from harvesting labor opportunities and uh, animal product in pastoral areas. Widespread minimal IPC phase one outcomes are expected in most agricultural and agro-pastoral areas of a region. In urban centers and some agro-pastoral and pastoral areas, the decline in household food stock and the decline in purchasing power due to inflation and insecurity limit the ability of poor households to meet their food and non-food needs. As a result, these households are unable to adequately satisfy their food and non-food needs without resorting to an atypical intensification of labor. They are in stress or IPC phase two. Persistence in security in conflict, in conflict affected areas and deteriorating livelihood impact household access 
to food and income in the Liptakokurma region. Lake Chad Basin, the northwest and southwest region of Cameroon, the northeast in Nigeria, and the northern province of Chad. Crisis epicephalus free persists in this area throughout the period. Crisis.com are also expected to the eastern provinces of Chad due to the influx of Sudanese refugees. The emergency APC phase 4 is expected in the Lorum, Sum, Odalan, and Yaka provinces of Burkina Faso, and the inaccessible LGAs in northeastern Nigeria states, Abadan, Guzamala, Marti, Parna in Nigeria, and will persist until May due to limited household food stock, limited access to markets, and humanitarian aid. As we move into second projection period, February to May, includes the beginning of the pastoral lean season as main pasture and water point dry up, leading to widespread stress that come across pastoral areas of the Sahel. While most households in agricultural and pastoral areas will continue to meet their food and income needs through residual stocks from the main rainy season as well as off-season harvest, an expansion of crisis outcomes are expected in conflict-affected areas as households deplete their below-average stocks. Emergency outcomes are expected to persist in northern Burkina Faso and in north northeast Nigeria. Next slide, please. And um, uh, from this, we will begin with the uh, area of our highest concern, uh, begin with Nigeria. So I will hand over to Anu. Thank you so, Mar so much, Marius. Um, yes, hi, everybody. My name is Anu Atre, as Lita mentioned. I'm a food security analyst with FuseNet. Um, so I wanted to talk about a bit, a bit about Nigeria. Nigeria remains one of our key areas of concern in the region, and many of the reasons Marius uh, mentioned due to the ongoing macroeconomic crisis, persisting conflict in the northeast, northwest, and north center, and the poor cereal production across the north that we've had in this past or the, in this harvest season. First, looking at the economic conditions. So the macroeconomic crisis continues to deteriorate in Nigeria, resulting in some of the worst um, economic conditions Nigeria has seen in the last two decades. On the left is a graph overlaying annual headline inflation and the value of the Nigerian Naira, with annual headline inflation being on the rise since early 2022 and hitting 26.7% in September, as Marius mentioned. This is the highest on record since September 2005 um, and primarily driven be, uh, by food and fuel prices. So national um, petrol prices increased by over 200% in early June 2023 due to the lifting of the petrol subsidy, but it has also continued to rise now over the next four to, four to five months after uh, the lift and has increased by about 25 more percent since then. On the top right, you can see uh, the example for Maidogori in Borno State, where petrol prices surpassed 600 Naira per liter in Maidogori Town specifically. But in some of the more rural parts of Borno State, such as Bama, Mobar, and Monguno LGAs, WFP has reported that petrol prices are now over 1,000 Naira per liter. These high petrol prices are due to the combined impacts, as I mentioned, of the fuel subsidy lifting in June, but also limited domestic oil refinery capacity, low, na no, low national reserves, constraining national purchasing power, and more recently elevated global crude oil prices in August and September. This has spiked transportation co uh, costs and thus food prices across the country. And so looking at the bottom graph, maize prices in September 2023 relative to last September and the five-year average, even at the onset of the early green harvest in September, stable food prices were at record high levels. In Maidogori, LGA on the farthest to the right, maize prices were over 100% higher than they were last September and roughly 180% higher than they were of the five-year average. The prices have since come down slightly with the seasonal um, as the season has progressed into the harvest, however, still remaining considerably higher than last year at average. 
As commodity prices have been high across the board, the Naira continues to devalue in relation to the United States dollar. So following these key shifts in economic policies in late May, we've been seeing the, the free fall essentially of the Naira. And as though it's not shown on this graph on the left, the October exchange rates hit a record low of 1200 Naira per USD at the parallel window and 810 Naira per USD on the official window. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, <laughs> well, just going back to the economic side, these factors have resulted in um, household purchasing power deteriorating significantly, reducing financial access to food for millions of households, particularly those in the conflict affected regions that are highly market reliant for food. Next slide. So now looking into the conflict side of things, in October, high levels of conflict and violent crime continue in the Northeast and the Northwest and parts of the North Center with particular increases in kidnapping victims and incidents. So op opportunistic criminals have increasingly turned to kidnapping for financial payout as the economic situation has deteriorated. These two maps here show the number of reported abductees per LGA this year. And when comparing the map on the right, which portrays the June, September, June to September period with the map on the left showing the January to April period, we see a 110% increase in the number of reported abductees between these two periods. Similarly, in, there was a roughly 65% increase in abducted related incidents from June to September 2023 relative to that same period last June, uh, last year. Based on ground information and the ACLED report incidents, these increases are largely due to the worsening economic conditions, including low household purchasing power, as well as the, the harsh lean season that was ongoing during, to, during that June to September period. The increase in kidnapping and violent crime has heightened fear, restricted mobility, and decreased engagement in livelihood activities during a pretty critical period for both crop growth and now into the harvest period. So more recent field reports are indicating high levels of farmer targeted attacks as well as fishing uh, targeted attacks and high levels of farmer extortion, particularly in the Northeast where insurgents are demanding uh, high taxation in the form of harvests or um, crops in exchange for safe passage and in the Northwest similarly with um, bandits. Next slide, please. So in early November, FuseNet conducted a field assessment to, um, or sorry, a rapid field visit to two informal IDP settlements in Sokoto Town in Sokoto State in Northwest Nigeria. In the October outlook, FuseNet classified primarily stressed IPC phase two and crisis IPC phase three outcomes in Sokoto State, while indicating that there is a subset of the population, including IDPs and informal settlements in the Northwest, that are likely facing, um, facing emergency or IPC phase four outcomes due to the lack of access of income and high reliance on negative coping strategies to access food. Our field visit confirmed the likelihood of emergency IPC phase four outcomes among some of these households, and our analysis is ongoing right now to determine the likelihood of catastrophe. IOM estimates that there are left roughly 100, sorry, 1.2 million IDPs in Northwest North Center with 65,000 IDPs in Sokoto State. However, these figures are from December 2022 and um, FuseNet expects there to likely be considerably more IDPs, particularly in the Northwest and especially in Sokoto State. The informal settlement we visited had roughly 600 to 800 households, but no humanitarian partners are registering or monitoring arrivals. And it's difficult to know how many informal settlements there are in Sokoto or across the Northwest in general, given how fluid the situation is. In the settlements visited, IDPs were primarily women and children and had no access to land for cultivation, limited household assets, and were largely unable to engage in the formal labor market. Some households reported being able to generate income from informal day labor, such as domestic housekeeping. However, um, many of the women were heavily reliant on livelihood coping strategies associated with emergency or IPC phase four 
outcomes such as begging and prostitution to obtain food on a daily basis. Despite engagement in these emergency IPC phase four coping strategies, households still reportedly face large con food consumption gaps, reporting limiting meal sizes, skipping meals and going days without eating. Um, as seen in the photos on the top, or the photo on the top right, the primary water source for domestic use is a contaminated shallow well. So those who were physically capable reported accessing a, a tap stand four kilometers away for consumption. However, those unable to travel there reported even consuming this water. The reliance on contaminated water sources is of high concern for food utilization and disease risk in these settlements. The image down below shows the, the only food fuse that observed in the informal settlement during the visit, which the IDPs interviewed indicated was obtained through income from prostitution. Households in the settlement visited in general were receiving no HFA or no humanitarian food assistance and no access to health or nutrition services. Um, and FuseNet is working on a more in-depth analysis, as I mentioned which will be um, incorporated into the December Food Security Outlook update coming out later this month. Next slide. So looking at the projected acute food insecurity outcomes from October 2023 to January 2024, the macroeconomic conditions in Nigeria are, as I mentioned, the worst they've been in nearly two decades. And this coupled with the below average crop production is exacerbated, exacerbating the impacts of 15 years of conflict and, and displacement in the Northeast and nearly 10 years of conflict and displacement in the Northwest. In this period, Borno State will, is expected to remain the highest area of concern with emergency outcomes expected, or IPC phase four outcomes expected in Bamba, Abadam, Marte, and Guzamala LGAs due to the highly restricted mobility, poor crop production aspect prospects limited access to functional markets and high reliance on begging and wild food consumption despite being in the post-harvest period. Crisis is expected in many LGAs in, in uh, Borno State as well as some parts of the Northwest, including Sokoto, Zamfara, Katsina, and Kaduna States. Um, we do expect to see general improvements um, in acute food insecurity with the main season harvest across the South, North, Center, and parts of the Northeast. However, the below average harvests are limiting normal seasonal improvements in food consumption during this period. Next slide. Looking into the February to May 2024 period, Borno State is expected to remain the area with the most severe outcomes with the same four LGAs, Bama, Abadam, Guzamala, and Marte, maintaining emergency IPC phase four outcomes as they maintain um, complete inaccessibility and difficult access, difficulty accessing um, crops, markets, and uh, heavily depleted coping capacity. In early 2024, poor households are expected to begin exhausting their harvests in mark as market prices spike with the reduced supply and increased demand. Purchasing power will likely remain low at this point and resulting in an expected increase in food consumption gaps in both the Northeast, including Borno and the Northwest. Widespread crisis IPC phase three outcomes are most likely in Borno state with an increase in crisis IPC phase three in both the Northwest and the North Center ahead of the lean season. If we do not see an, an alleviation in some of the poor economic conditions in early 2024, we expect an early onset of the lean season across the north in potentially around the April or May period. And that actually concludes the Nigeria area of concern portion. So I'll hand it over now to Lita. Thanks, Anu. And we will now finish it off with Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso continues to see a rather marked deterioration of its security conditions as armed groups continue to expand their control over new areas, moving into the Centre Nord Est and even conducting large scale attacks in the Bouc du Mouhoun, Centre West, Aubassin, and Cascade regions. As we can see on the graph on the right, which is showing conflict events and fatalities by region for this year. 
Now, the Nor, Sahel, Est, and now even the Bukudumuhun regions continue to be key hotspots for conflict in Burkina Faso as armed groups continue to pressure civilian populations and maintain blockades on several key supply routes. Now, overall, these blockades have led to a widespread reduction in humanitarian access, as we can see on the map on the left, though there are varying degrees of the impact of these blockades on the severity of restrictions of population, humanitarian, and commercial movements. So according to FuseNet's latest understanding, and this is based on information from key informants, information gathered from the market information system, and exchanges with key humanitarian partners, We'd estimate that there are between 30 and 40 blockaded areas, of which about 10 to 15 have a very narrow radius of mobility. Re uh, and this represents nearly a doubling compared to the same time last year. Now, of primary concern remains Jibo municipality, which has the most one of the most severe blockades that restricts movement and limits agro-pastoral activities. Um, also, this blockade results in long delays in market supplies, which leads to food shortages, and the delivery of humanitarian food assistance can really only be done via airdrop. However, several other municipalities under are also under blockade with rather severe restrictions on movement, though the impacts on the population are also dependent on the agro-pastoral activities that are able to take place within the radius of security, the distance of that municipality to key supply centers, the potential for illicit trade flows with other areas controlled by armed groups, etc. Um, this is the case, for example, for Arbinda, which is also in Sum province, as well as Seba in Yaga province, um, both in the Sahel region of Burkina Faso. Um, I just note that the situation is extremely volatile in um, these other blockaded areas as well. Um, and FuseNet continues to monitor these, these areas closely as concern for these areas continues to rise. So the this year actually represents the second consecutive year that conflict events in absolute terms have actually decreased in Burkina Faso. This is the case particularly in the Sahel, North and Est regions. However, fatalities have continued to increase. Um, this year, they increased by uh, over 118% compared to last year. And this means that armed groups attacks are actually increasingly complex and each attack tends to have more casualties. Now, while conflict events in the Sahel have decreased in absolute terms, as we can see on the graph here on the right, um, it does remain the region with the highest overall conflict events and where humanitarian access is the lowest, as we can see on the map on the left. Now, as I mentioned earlier, armed groups continue to expand into new areas of Burkina Faso, as we can see by the increase in security incidents in central Burkina Faso. The graph on this slide is showing conflict events in the Bulk du Muhun region this year, um, and we've seen a notable increase in the past uh, few months in um, attacks in the Bulk du Muhun region. Now, this supports the assumption that armed groups have reached some of their strategic objectives in northern and eastern Burkina Faso and are now likely pivoting forces and resources inland in order to further pressure FDS supply lines, as well as extend their influence over civilian populations in areas that were previously less impacted by militant violence. Now, as I mentioned, Jibo remains FuseNet's area of highest concern within Burkina Faso and continues to face a risk of famine. As a reminder, FuseNet first issued a risk of famine for Jibo in February 2023, following what was then a year-long blockade that severely constrained population movement and population's ability to access most sources of food and income. We're now in October, which means that we're nearing two years of a blockade. Uh, actually, we're in December, apologies, which uh, we're even closer to two years of a blockade. And since then, there have been two market supply deliveries under military escort, one in March and one in June that increased slightly increased food availability on the market. However, there are reports that demand for food on the market remains low, as most households lack even the income to purchase food. 
Instead, households typically rely on bartering or purchasing on credit or emergency purchases with whatever funds they can find. Now, as we can see on the graph on the right that shows the percentage of the population of GBO that received humanitarian food assistance so far this year, humanitarian assistance via airdrop scaled up to reach on average 25 to 30 percent of the population as of March of this year. However, it's important to note that the implementation of food assistance for IDPs and poor host households remains a significant challenge due to security constraints that limit humanitarian access and financial and logistical constraints linked to the increase in municipalities across Burkina Faso that require assistance to be delivered under military escort or by air, as well as the costly nature of delivering humanitarian food assistance via helicopter. Now, these logistical constraints also include the inadequacy and low capacity of helicopters that are available to transport food, as well as the requirement to register each flight with the military. And as a result, we've found that humanitarian assistance intervention plans are generally not implemented on time and do not typically reach the targeted number of beneficiaries. Now, during the peak of the lean season, in which FuseNet assessed that households were actually primarily reliant on food assistance um, that was likely preventing more extreme outcomes. WFP airdrop deliveries, coupled with in-kind food assistance from the government that was brought in with the market convoy of June, reached on average about 30% of the population. However, with the depletion of the government assistance, as well as a seasonal scale down in assistance linked to the harvest period, humanitarian assistance was set to reach just 16% of the population monthly between October and December. However, in mid-October, increased insecurity in GBO led to the suspension of humanitarian flights to GBO, and this included humanitarian cargo flights that transported food aid. Now, the last humanitarian food assistance distribution took place in early November to just over a thousand recipients, which represents uh, less than 1% of the total population of GBO. And finally, an important update is that on November 26th, a large scale coordinated attack on military and civilians has further constrained the already meager sources of food in, in, in GBO uh, that we'll get into in just a second. Now, taking a step back to FuseNet's analysis of GBO prior to the suspension of humanitarian food assistance and the attack in late November, the graph on the left here shows FuseNet's household economy approach outcome analysis results for very poor households in GBO, where the leftmost bar on the graph shows very poor households access to food and income in a baseline year compared to their access to sources of food and income in the current 2023-2024 consumption year, shown by the middle bar. And these sources of food and income are represented as a percentage of households' minimum food needs. As we can see, most sources of food and income this year are nearly exhausted and are not only well below what households typically had in the baseline year, but also well below the survival threshold or what households would need in order to survive. It's important to keep in mind that, that, that this graph is showing uh, an annual deficit and not necessarily that households are sustaining these levels of deficits day to day. However, it's clear that households were already facing extreme food consumption gaps prior to the November attack. Now, the November attack has further implications for household food consumption um, that we will now detail. So already insufficient commercial food stocks were burned during the attack. Um, it was reported that several traders uh, stocks and warehouses were burned during the attack on the military outpost. And as a result of the attack, the perimeter for a safe population movement um, has further tightened, um, not only due to the increased presence of armed groups, but also due to the increased fear that households are feeling in and around GBO. And so now it was um, reported that households are scared to even go as far as the GBO Dam, where they have been previously been able to harvest some vegetables along the dam, um, their households are even scared to, to go that far. Um, additionally, this um, 
decreased radius of safety, limits households' ability to gather wild foods, as well as gather um, firewood and water that were key sources of income for populations. As such, key informants in Jibo are reporting that many households are consuming just one meal a day and are supplementing staple green grains with wild leaves. Additionally, it was reported that local service providers no longer have food stocks to distribute to households in need. Prior to this, some government services, including the town mayor, had some emergency food stocks um, that they were using to distribute to worst off households. And it was reported in late November and early December that even these emergency uh, government stocks um, have now been depleted. Finally, um, prior to the, no to the November attack, FuseNet had assessed that households that were able to produce um, had on average stocks to last perhaps between one and three months. However, with the decreased availability of food, we'd anticipate that households that were able to produce a harvest run the risk of exhausting their food stocks even earlier than projected. And of particular concern is the continued suspension of humanitarian food assistance airdrops that if they these airdrops remain suspended, we'd anticipate that acute malnutrition and mortality levels would rise in the near term. So as I mentioned, FuseNet continues to warn of a risk of famine for GBO. FuseNet's most likely scenario for GBO continues to um, be based on the assumptions that are outlined on the left-hand side of this slide, which include that some households will continue to be able to engage in some market gardening activities, particularly around the Jibo Dam, but also in some of the peri-urban um, areas of the Jibo Town Center. And we do anticipate that the Jibo market will be periodically supplied by military escort, though it should be noted that already it's been um, six months since the last market supply. Um, and while we've heard reports that the government continues to try to uh, get a convoy to make it to Jibo, um, the security conditions um, required to make it all the way to Jibo um, call for, you know, a very, a, an extremely volatile situation, um, which results in long delay periods. The availability of cash will continue to be limited in Jibo given movement restrictions and no functioning banking system. Some households will likely continue to rely on some remittances from households outside of Zoom province that they're able to receive through informal networks. Um, while the June to September rainfall increased the availability of wild food, um, the access to collecting these wild foods will be periodically limited by conflict, as mentioned, was the case following the November attack. Households, uh, while this was a prim predominantly agro-pastoral area, households lack access to livestock sales or livestock um, milk production as most households either sold off or lost their livestock much earlier on in the blockade. And finally, um, we anticipate that humanitarian assistance will likely continue to be distributed via air. However, um, given the security situation, it's unclear when humanitarian airdrops will resume and FuseNet does not have um, access to planned humanitarian assistance for 2024. Now, FuseNet has just released an alert or is just about to release an alert um, in which we detail that the recent events in Jibo underscore FuseNet's risk of famine for Jibo province. Um, and warn of increasing alarm for the risk of famine in Jibo. Um, 
As a reminder, FuseNet warned that famine IPC fi phase five could occur if conflict further restricts the already low levels of cultivation, humanitarian aid, and market supplies even more than currently anticipated. But it's important to note that it's unlikely that evidence documenting the existence or absence of famine will be obtained in the near term in GIBO. Partners are unable to collect sufficient food data on food consumption, nutrition, or even mortality due to insecurity in the area, as well as telecommunications blackouts. And a classification of famine only confirms that lives have already been lost and the accumulation of deaths have already reached a critical tipping point that is difficult to reverse. So the level of concern for the risk of famine will only intensify the longer that the blockade persists and the longer that food assistance remains suspended. Already, only 31% of Burkina Faso's um, 2023 HRP for addressing food insecurity is funded. And FuseNet would indicate that an immediate resumption of humanitarian assistance deliveries as well as guarantees of humanitarian access is urgently needed to save lives. However, government decision makers should not wait for confirmation of a famine before undertaking further action. I'll just conclude on FuseNet's current uh, most likely food security outcomes for Burkina Faso on the left showing the October to January period where um, October marks the post-harvest period for Burkina Faso, though, as we can see from the maps, the severity of hunger only decreases marginally in the post-harvest period across worst blockaded municipalities in the Sahel province, um, sorry, in the Sahel region and also in Lurum province of uh, the Nor region. Um, households are able to consume minimal harvests and wild foods as they're able to gather within their security radius, but continue to be primarily dependent on humanitarian food assistance. And as such, FuseNet expects emergency outcomes between October and January, uh, particularly in uh, Lurum province, Sum province, Udalan, and Yaga province. As we turn to February to May period, We'd expect uh, an expansion of crisis outcomes across most of northern Burkina Faso, as well as an expansion of emergency outcomes to Seno province um, in the Sahel region, as households in these conflict-affected areas deplete their below-average stocks and have reduced access to um, typical off-season harvests. I just underscore once again the um, FuseNet's continuing risk of famine for Jibo and our persisting and increasing level of concern for the risk of famine for Jibo um, that will intensify the longer that the blockade persists and that food assistance remains suspended in Jibo. So with that, I will conclude FuseNet's food security outlook briefing. 